Our last speaker before lunch is Lucinda Corrigan. Lucinda and her husband Brian run an Angus business in the Bona Valley. It's a leading beef genetics business. Rennie Lee supplies commercial producers across Australia and international markets. Lucinda has skills and experience in communications, marketing, advocacy, and for 20 years has served as non-executive director on industry bodies and innov innovation companies. During the last decade, she's been director of four cooperative research centres, is currently deputy chair of the CRC for Future Farming Industries. She also chairs the advisory committee for the EAH Graham Centre and the National Beef, Beef Genetics Advisory Committee. She's a fellow of the Institute of Company Directors and the Australian Rural Leadership Foundation. Lucinda. Thank you, Chris. One of my favourite sayings is that it's not far from the penthouse to the outhouse. So um, today's success can be tomorrow's failure, so you never want to believe the rhetoric. Um, I've been asked to speak about really what we've done in our own business over the last 20 years and how we've tried to adapt to uh, change. And um, uh, the suggestion was I talked about to 2020. Well, I think 2020 is really next week in our family business, which is uh, we're a sort of 40, fourth generation uh, since uh, 1870 um, at Weimar. And so I've called it to 2050, trying to take some of the, the uh, longer term uh, challenges that we're facing. So that's our vision to create a dynamic uh, family based agribusiness, which is an enjoyable place to work with positive environmental outcomes. And what I've done, I did, I did write a fair bit, and it's in your proceedings, but I knew I, in 15 minutes, which I was given, although I can see I've got a little bit more time because Phil. Um, gave me a bit of time. I've got, I'll, I'll be able to talk a little bit uh, more to each slide. So what I've done is put together a series of pictures to sort of illustrate the principles. So this is uh, Rennie Lee. It's um, classic southwest slopes in New South Wales country, um, light granite soils, uh, mainly uh, cleared, so it's a fairly modified uh, grazing environment. Um, uh, that's, uh, a photo. I've got lots of photos from over the years in this presentation. That one was taken as we went into the 2002-03 dry period, shall I say. And um, that's the valley floors. This is uh, taken from a helicopter the other day. We were spraying some um, bracken fern. And uh, in 2010, we um, bought back half the original property over the road. So we're just in a major... Um, development program on that property because it hadn't had much done for 40 years. So you can actually see, we fenced off 23 hectares last year and you can see the tree lines down the bottom of the valley there and uh, this is the uh, new perennial pasture we're putting in this year, it's just been limed. Um, an iconic feature of our landscape is the half moon gap, you can see it from lots of places, Albury and so on, so it's, and it's actually our earmark. And uh, we, we really love the Half Moon Gap, so <laughs> there's, a, there's a photo of the Half Moon Gap. Um, our system has been based on improving the perennial pasture base uh, over really since about 1990. I've been there since the mid-80s, and uh, we sort of pushed the go button after we split off the family business in the eight, late 80s. So this is classic uh, phalaris-based, uh, phalaris and um, clover-based pastures on the valley floor um, at Weimar. In the mid-90s, um, well, in the early 90s, I went off and got a job because I said to Brian I didn't have enough to do. And um, so he said, oh, Lord, you can't do that. Um, it was a three-day-a-week job with Greening Australia. So we went off and we found some country at Culcan. So this is um, Ellerslie Park, which is the first place uh, south of Culcan on the Olympic Way. That's in 2009, so that was a really gorgeous autumn, if you all remember 2009. Um, and at... On that Cull Can country on the Billabong Creek, we've really been able to um, uh, develop some, some, a serious area of uh, lucerne, which is giving us, um, I think, the resilience we need to keep a fairly large herd of cattle going uh, in, the, in the dry season. So that was actually taken during the drought, and that's Tabletop Mountain over there in, in the background. But this is, so we've, um, we've set up perennial systems. The place had about 29 trees on it when we bought it, so we've, we've planted... Um, tens of thousands of trees over there, and um, the loosened pastures have really become um, a really important part of uh, using water more efficiently during the summer, out of season rainfall, and um, 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 f conserving fodder for uh, the tough times. 
Uh, this is a ryegrass-based pasture. That was in 2005. You might remember we had a, we had a lot of rainfall in 2005, but not particularly, um, not, not much during the winter. So we ended up with a, a huge spring, um, but, 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 but the subsoil moisture wasn't as high as often is the case with high rainfall. So over the years, we've um, increased our effective area. Um, Brian and I started with 400 hectares, and we're currently sitting on about 2,600 hectares with a lot of debt. So we are, we are risk takers, and, um, but we've been keen to increase scale to give ourselves uh, more resilience and, um, and create a, a more viable long-term operation. So really, I wanted to start with the people factor, because I think if we look at the triple bottom line in our business, there's really nothing more important than um, the people who work in the business and, and their capability. So the first thing I'd say was, you know, moving to a, what I call an HR approach to employing people. We've just been uh, replacing one of the members of the team at home. Uh, this week we've been interviewing. And I think if you, can, if you can build a reputation as being an employer of choice, which is, is something that's talked about in, in other industries besides agriculture, you do find you attract a fantastic range of candidates. So we've had uh, a couple of dozen people apply for this job. Interestingly, and I'm sorry Dave Sackett's not here anymore, we've had two people come back out of corporate farming and say that they really want to work in a family farming operation, which I think is really interesting. So I think you can build that reputation and you can attract, attract really, really good quality people. We're still waiting for our lead candidate to accept the job. <laughs> um, group learning, I think, has been a really important part of what we do, um, working with participatory um, on-farm R&D. And uh, we've had a series of those over the years, and I've named some of them in my, in my um, paper. We've had a fantastic range of consultants over the years, including, I've just added succession planning there, because we are now working with um, a very experienced uh, lawyer in, in Aubrey, who's, who's very good at this sort of thing, just, just setting up um, a process so we can transition to generation five. And I wanted to mention our social contract. Um, because I'm on the board of Meat and Livestock Australia, I suppose I've, we've got a very raw uh, experience of what happened with the closure of the live export trade last year and the grief that it is still causing in, in northern Australia. But we know that there'll be lots more um, Lynn White episodes in, in our industry in the future. And, and I think um, preparing ourselves for that, having that conversation with Urban Australia about what we do and learning to do that better Knowing that I, I was at a, a, doing a workshop with MLA in Broome recently, and um, you know, and it was actually with um, women in in, um, in the Kimberley, and um, they recognised, for instance, that, that flank spaying is probably not a pro procedure we're going to be able to do in the future forever. So, finding um, having the research in the pipeline that will enable us to move away from perhaps animal husbandry practices that we've always accepted as being okay. Um, is part of our social contract, and I think we, we, we take those things very seriously. Um, and and we, we are always interested in creating opportunities for the young, so we do, we do have quite a few students come and work with us, especially from Charles Sturt University, and we're just in the process of setting up an animal science scholarship there. This is our team. I, I'd, I'd call um, this couple joined us 12 years ago. This is Peter and Sue Garvin and their, and their daughters. The little one was only five when they came. So we've seen their family grow up, but the, Peter and his family run, Peter and Sue run the property at Colcairn, and they are fantastic people. They came out of the dairy industry. We're about to listen to a couple of dairy farmers. But there's no doubt that those skills in dairy farming are just as applicable to, to beef farming, and we've been very fortunate to have people of, of that calibre working with us. Um, this is our group at Holbrook that uh, we do our um, alternate fertiliser trial with. It's probably raised more questions than given us answers, but it's been fantastic working with, that's Ian Locke, I'm handing out the handouts there, Jeff Hirth, uh, Nigel Phillips sitting here on the chair, he's the district agronomist in Wagga. It's really brought together a group of people who are discussing the issues that are, that are challenging us all the time, and it's a great model, and that's under the umbrella of the Holbrook Landcare Network, which has been reformed as a grower sort of knowledge group since, since the drought along the lines of the Birchip Cropping Group. So that's been uh, a really important um, part of our group learning. This is Angus, who's joined us recently. He's a second-generation Zimbabwean Scot and uh, been in Australia about eight years and, and moved over to the east when he read about our job from Western Australia. And Matt, who's leaving us, he's been with us six years. 
but the, but the team environment is very important. And this, of course, is us. <laughs> so that's, the, that's our family, and, um, but all members of the team are equally important. Um, so our big challenge in terms of environmentally is getting our grazing systems right, and, and especially in those tough years. And, and the basis of what we do is keeping uh, the cow herd, which we call the factory, which is what produces you know, our product, intact during, during the droughts. So I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, we've, um, we, we've invested in sort of good infrastructure, laneways and stock control, um, strategic grazing and spelling as part of the system. We now have capacity for, for 1,000 acres of lucerne to do some serious fodder conservation. Um, and we've, we've brought in a new, um, over the drought, we set, started sending our cows up to Cancoban Station each year, and that was uh, such a great relief in, in the, fail, the run of failed autumns that we've actually kept that going. So this year we've got 500 cows at Cancoban and feed coming out our ears, but we call it our insurance policy. And, and we're also in the process of building a feedlot for, so that we'll be able to carry all our weaned calves from any drop um, in a feedlot, and that's at Colcan. We all remember that. <laughs> it's, not, it's not a fun memory, but when I was digging up these pictures, um, um, we, we don't want to go there again. So that's, that's young um, weaners um, on one of our hill paddocks in, I think that was in the autumn of 2009. So that was one of the not so fun years. Um, and that's uh, some of the country at Bona uh, at the same time. So, um, so what we've been able to do is to um, yeah, acquire this uh, a second block at Culcan, which we also bought in 2010. And um, this is uh, a it's, it, it grows a lot of loose, and it's trebled the production of dry matter off that country by putting loose in there compared to the annual base pastures that were there. And uh, it's, it's an important part of the strategy. Sorry, that's not much of a photo, but that's uh, Cancoven Station, and the cows are up there at the moment. And um, so they're grazing underneath uh, the, uh, the main range. But um, we've, we've kept that on, as I said, as a, um, as a bit of a drought strategy. So, I mean, other parts of what we do environmentally, we've been planting trees since, um, since 1990. Um, I, I, did, I did have a tally. It's something like 230 hectares. And um, a lot of those, especially the more recent plantings in the last decade, have been um, just with sort of indigenous species. When we started, we, we planted basically what was available from the nurseries. And um, some of those, some of those uh, plantations look a little bit um, monocultured mono and they don't have the, the, the range of, um, I guess, ground and shrub sp species through to, to trees. But the recent ones are, are beautiful and they've got a lot of, a lot of the small birds have returned to those, um, those plantings. We really focus on perenniality in the, in the farming system, both, um, so I guess, the herbaceous perennials and um, we're still battling with rabbits and weeds. Um, rabbits are really endemic in our, um, especially in, uh, at Rennie Lee in the, um, in the hills and uh, the place we took over last year, we're, we're, we're battling to get rid of those. Probably the big weakness in our system is monitoring. Um, we do, we have spates of monitoring. We monitor our piezometers and then we monitor our water quality or, and we do ground cover, but I'm not sure that we do them all in, in, in uh, quite as often as we should. We also have some special places. This is on that um, Cull Can country, you probably know there's, um, there's these, these quite um, beautiful um, indentations in the landscape which have uh, red gums and, and they fill with water. So they didn't have any water in them for 10 years and the red gums look pretty stressed, but now they've all filled up with water again. This is, a, this is about a um, 15 or 20 hectare paddock at the back of the place that we just don't run stock in anymore because it's just filled with water and um, there's a lot of regeneration. Um, we've also put in a solar tracker, um, with, and that's producing the electricity for um, the two properties at, at, at Wyma. We're planning to um, put um, solar onto all the houses as uh, the, the current systems wear out one by one. So I guess getting to the economic issues, um, there was a bit of a talk about scale before, and I think scale's been a really important thing for us in terms of building some long-term business resilience. And so we've increased the size of business to about 30 thousand um, dry sheep equivalents and um, that's enabled us to improve our labour efficiency. Having said that, we do run with a lot of labour. Um, our job's really all about um, detail and accuracy in terms of measuring animals and recording them and uh, doing, a good, uh, doing a good job. I've just, I've just finished, in fact, um, Brian doesn't even know about it yet, so I'm sharing it with you, but <laughs> I've just finished a 20-year study with Home Sacker just looking at our... Um, 
because I've been benchmarking for 20 years, benchmarking the business, so I've had that all put together, so I just happen to have a few of these slides available. But that's our cost structure. I mean, costs are always a, a problem. That, you know, they're increasing. You can see the high variable costs during the drought. Um, the, middle, the middle part is the, um, the overheads, and uh, the red is the profit. This is, this is business returns, not tax returns, of course. Um, and uh, that's the, 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 the variation in return on um, assets over the 20-year period. So, like David was saying earlier, you know, you, you make a lot of your profit in those, in those years where the stars align, and you really want to be in a position um, where, you can, where you can make the profits when um, seasons and prices align. I guess for us, um, there's a lot of issues um, that we think about for the future. You know, how we, how we balance risk and uncertainty in a changing climate. And, um, and, and, and I guess we're, we're, we're trying to adapt over time and bring in systems where we're not going to have some of the shocks that we felt in the, especially in the 2002, 3 and 6, 6 7 was pretty drastic for us. You're running, I think it was 2,500 cattle at the time. And, uh, yep. and um, we, you know, we were, we were very exposed um, in, in terms of uh, keeping the cow herd going. Um, I think research and developments for us at, at the end of the supply chain where we are is a really important part of what we do. And we've always been involved in um, um, beef CRCs, so we've provided uh, cattle and um, um, on-farm data collection for over the last 20 years. So what we're doing at the moment, we're doing a business restructure and I'm actually setting up, we're going to have an R&D sort of entity within, within our structure. So if we're asked to do those things again, we've been approached by a couple of the national research bodies to do th things. We're in, a, in, a, we're in, a, we're in a, a, a position where we can do that. And also, I guess there's a range of new products we can get into. I mean, we are in, at the value ad ad added end of the industry. I just want to put this up because this is the principle I'm talking about with R&D. If you look at Australia's uh, federal government innovation budget, which is something I'm passionate about. Um, you'll see that, for instance, the Rural Research and Development Corporations are only a couple of percent of that budget. You'll see the CSIRO at about, um, uh, whatever it is, 9%, I have trouble reading. Um, National Health and Medical Research Council at 12%. But over there on that side in the white is the tax concessions, which are given to business for research and development. And I think a lot of small and medium enterprises don't take advantage of those tax concessions, which I think run at about 145% for businesses that turn over less than 20 million. So that's the, that's the principle that we're, we're, we're looking to take forward. Future solutions, David mentioned Tadera. You know, Tadera comes from the Canary Island. It grows up the side of the volcano, the volcano behind Tenerife in about a 200 and something millimetre rainfall. It looks like the most exciting legume that's come into Australia since Lucerne. It's got about eight more years in the R&D pipeline. I hope I'm still farming when it finally hits the streets because I think it'll play a role in, in our environment. Um, I mentioned new products. Uh, I don't know if anyone can see those, but that's um, some Brahman Angus cross cattle that we're breeding for uh, a couple of clients in Queensland. They're certainly different to handle, and um, our guys have a bit of grief with them, but we're, um, we're, we're doing that on contract for a couple of people. And there are other sort of crossbreeding exercises that we could get into for, uh, you know, on demand. We, we do quite a lot of contract breeding now. Um, so whatever the storm is that it's approaching, we'd like to think we can set ourselves up for, a, for the fifth generation and, um, and uh, cope with uh, the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. Thank you. <laughs>